majority rapport with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The majority rapport with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. <laughs> it is Wednesday. May 31st, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Ken Klippenstein, investigative reporter at The Intercept. On the Pentagon's new perception management office. Also on the program today, Nick Turris, contributing writer at The Intercept, on the total injustice of Henry Kissinger making it to 100 years old. That's easy when you like have no soul because you don't stress. It's true. Debt deal heads to the House floor today for a vote. Appears it will pass at least in the House, and then questions linger about the deal in the Senate. The SEIU files an antitrust suit against a Pennsylvania hospital network. It is the first of its kind in decades challenging corporate monopsony in hiring. Chapter 11 for me, not for thee, as the court rules Sacklers can be shielded from their opioid liability. Minnesota will have legal weed by August. Conservatives now boycotting Chick-fil-A for not hating gays enough. Twitter deemed to have lost 67% of its valuation since the genius Elon Musk has taken over. Republican House member Chris Stewart to resign nearly immediately, tightening Republican uh, minor, uh, majority in the House. It's not good news for you New York or California Republicans. Meanwhile, U.S. to send another $300 million to Ukraine, including drone munitions and lastly sedan peace talks are now suspended all this and more on today's majority report welcome ladies and gentlemen thanks for joining us it is of course god i wish i could come up with a new uh, thing for this day but it never occurs to me until i'm in the moment it is of course uh the day that um Basically made it possible for my uh, co-host to have a huge yacht that mm -hmm. she uh, parks on the East River. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the way that you, you get to work every day, right? You take that yacht across I, the river. And... I, yeah, I t yeah, I take the yacht um, and I, it's called uh, Libtard Cock. Uh, <laughs> and um, I announced that's why I came in today. It's hump day, baby. There you go. Uh, it is hump day, ladies and gentlemen. Halfway through a shortened work week. Uh, if you missed, for whatever reason, the Memorial Day uh, interview uh, that I did with Greg Mitchell, check that out. Um, he did a 27-minute documentary and wrote a companion book to the story of all the strikes that were happening in the 30s, particularly around the um, uh, steel manufacturers. And there was one strike or actually it really wasn't even a strike i think at that point it was just it wasn't even on that day a labor action it was more of a solidarity picnic and um republic steel brought in uh just tons of chicago cops and they just opened fire on these union picnickers um Really fascinating story that was buried more or less 
at the time and then lost to history. And it really, um, it's definitely a, a, a good companion piece uh, to the interview we did a couple of weeks ago about um, the attacks on uh, black folk during Reconstruction and early Reconstruction. And just the implications of history, or I should say reporting contemporaneously being suppressed and what that does to history decades out. Uh, so check that out if you missed it. Also, one other uh, note. We've mentioned this in the past. If you uh, are, are watching on uh, any platform, YouTube, Twitch, wherever it is, uh, and there is a chat, be careful uh, because there are people posing to be us, myself, Emma, who are supposedly offering like, I, I've, there's different versions of this. Hey, we'll, we'll interview on the show. We're going to send you a, a camera and you, you can, um, you know, a whole technical setup. You just need to send us $5,000 or whatever the scam is. I'll tell you right now, we will not be in the chat unless it is with our specific official YouTube uh, handle. Um, and, and I just, I rarely, I don't know that I've ever chatted anything in the, uh, in the chat, but l be that as it may, we will never ever solicit money from you in the chat or anything like that. That will never happen. Or in this the comment section, in the comment section, not on our blog, not nowhere. The only time that we will solicit money free from you, let's say become a member or um, support the this candidate or, you know, we're doing a fundraiser for whatever it is, will be, you will see my face or hear my voice. Now, that may be amended as, uh, you know, sort of like these deep fakes get created. <laughs> but for now, if anybody approaches you in the chat and supposedly is me or Emma or Matt or Bradley or anybody affiliated with the show, I would suggest to you, you uh, just totally uh, waste their time by asking ridiculous questions about zero sum or deontological or, you know, uh, who's that guy from the, with the, with the thing? Uh, Thanos. Thanos. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise it's not us. And, and kudos to, um, I'm not going to say their name, but uh, somebody who, um, in the chat, who alerted us to this. Uh, really appreciate it. All right. Um, as you know, debt ceiling vote happening in the House. The big hurdle was the Rules Committee yesterday. Two, I think it was, Republicans defected. Uh, the vote was 7-6. Um, and um, it passed the Rules Committee. It now goes to the uh, floor. That's going to happen later today. And, um, uh, you know, by all accounts, they were doing a whip count last night on a different bill, and they were getting a, a sense of it. So as of today, they uh, the Republicans think that they have enough votes to pass this. The distribution of that votes is important. And here is Matt Gates on uh, Newsmax. Um, I suspect he wouldn't have been saying this yesterday if he didn't know what the outcome was already going to be. Uh, what will the what will the Freedom Caucus do if the, the, the people who are objecting to this bill get overridden, if the Republicans get overridden by a, uh, a Republican speaker teaming up with Democrats to pass this bill? Uh, again, I think the operative question there is whether or not the speaker can get to a majority of the majority. If, if a majority of Republicans are against a piece of legislation and you use Democrats to pass it, that would immediately be a black letter violation of the deal we had with McCarthy to allow his assent to the speakership, and it would likely trigger an immediate motion to vacate. I think Speaker McCarthy knows that. That's why he's working hard to make sure that he gets, you know, 120, 150, 160 votes. And that's why those of us who are not supportive of the bill are trying to point out that many of of the changes are cosmetic in nature and 
Joe Biden's administration is going to be able to waive uh, certain requirements and certain conditions that sound like great talking points, but that don't save the country from the ruin that the Biden administration is bringing us to. Yeah, the uh, the absolute ruin that we're headed towards if we don't in any way inhibit people's ability, uh, some small cohort of people to get uh, food, food, food st support. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think he would have been saying that unless they thought they had the um, the the votes um, to a majority of, of Republican votes in the House. But I, I would anticipate seeing 100 Democrats vote for this as well. Well, they've already kind of preemptively set. Well, the, we have the problem uh, solvers, right? They're already in, of course. And then also there was in the midst of the negotiations, them essentially saying, hey, McCarthy, we've got your back. Some Democrats like we will save your speakership if if your far right flank revolts, which. Yeah, I, I find that like a dubious assert. That's the last thing you want to say. I, I agree. That's what you're doing. But I agree. But we'll see. Uh, and then it will head to the Senate, it, assuming it passes tonight and it will head to the Senate and. um in this instance, I will, I'm not in the YouTube chat, so I will bet uh, anyone um, $100 million that um, uh, Rand Paul uh, hems and haws a bit uh, about uh, passing this, and then ultimately, once they have the votes, they realize secure, they'll pass it. Yeah, I'm curious if in the end, uh, Joe Manchin's like pet project for the Mountain Valley Pipeline um, goes through because it seems like he's trying to leverage this opportunity to get the it fast tracked. Essentially, there's permits that need to be approved and it would be circumventing any judge in this way to get the what's necessary done to get this pipeline pushed through, which activists in West Virginia are not happy about. Yeah, I, I, I think it's definitely going to be part of the bill, as far as I can tell at this point. But I think there, I, I wonder if there isn't a legal strategy um, to, uh, in some way, uh, question this. But, but maybe there isn't. But yes, of course, Joe Manchin's going to make some money. I mean, that's, that's the way it works. And yeah. it's also, I mean, it's... Um, that's why you don't do it in December. Right. That's exactly why Joe Manchin didn't do it in December. Yep. And the party's got to be able to confront that at some point. Um, who do we have, Ken? All right. Um, yeah, let's just we play have, this. Oh, yeah. Here, yeah, we'll go clip. We'll clip no, let's just clip. Uh, we have him now. Okay, we do have him. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, We'll be talking to Ken Klippenstein, investigative reporter at The Intercept, who's written uh, a couple of pieces about the um, Pentagon's new perception management office. Sounds fun. We'll be right back. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Viglin on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us on the show now, Ken Klippenstein, investigative reporter at The Intercept. Stein? We <laughs> My God. We just clarified 10 seconds ago. I know. And then I just, I, I just said, I just kept telling myself, don't say crass and I could tell the way you paused. Uh, you yeah. Know, get it wrong. <laughs> Ken, welcome back to the program. As long as you call me Ed or Brian, then it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um uh you've written a piece and and there's some great reporting in this piece too let me congratulate you on that because this is um this feels like it was really buried um yeah and maybe 
uh, this is a wonderful uh, um, moment where form meets function. Uh, you're talking about the new perception management office uh, within the Pentagon. Give us some backstory as to the development of this office. So that term perception management harkens back to the Reagan administration. That is a term of art for what they use to try to shape the public perception of the um, support for the Contras in Nicaragua. And the background for that is interesting. It comes from, so what the administration did, the National Security Council took um, what was the top CIA propagandist at the time, moved him over to the NSC and put him in charge of that portfolio, the perception management portfolio. So it's basically a euphemism for propaganda, essentially. And, and they had a big problem at the time, which was that they were coming out of the Vietnam War. Um, I think what they called it was uh, Vietnam Syndrome. The idea that, oh, why, why would the public oppose this, you know, uh, the, the Contras had a bit of a PR problem on their hands because they kept, you know, doing these horrible atrocities to, you know, ch uh, including children. And so, you know, bad, bad image. And how do we manage that? Well, we're going to use perception management to try to respond to it. And it was the first, it, it was a big conflict after Vietnam where they're kind of like, where's the public going to come down? Can we get them back on board with our, uh, you know, with the worst aspects of our foreign policy, or is, or is the opposition going to remain? And what they found, at least at the beginning, was that the opposition remained, and so they had to do a lot of it covertly because the public opposed it. And that's a lot of, it's a big part of the story that's sort of lost when we talk about Iran-Contra, is why was it secret? It was secret because the public was opposed to it. Well, and uh, and there was actually the Boland Amendment, uh, which made right. it illegal to fund uh, these people um, and may, as a function probably of uh, a public per perception. Should also say, just as a sad, uh, side note, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, in uh, his invasion of Iraq, his version and, and you know, uh, <clears throat> I guess invasion of Kuwait was sold as the end of the Vietnam uh, syndrome era where we once and he was also the former head of the CIA. So uh, there's some uh, continuity there. So that's where this started. What about this? Why don't you tell us like how you found this Im embedded in the budget? Um, and then we'll, we'll go from there as to like what it supposedly is doing. Yeah, what's interesting, the Pentagon budget itself is thousands and thousands of pages long and hardly anybody goes through it. And it's not easy to go through. And in honesty, I had a little bit of help from people that, you know, work in the Pentagon pointing certain things out to me. But this is something that anyone could have found. It's just not something that the media tends not to report on um, the the weeds of these um, budget documents. So what's interesting about an office like this is they're, what they're dealing with is going to be so highly classified that um, there was no mention of the existence of this office prior to, there's no public record reference to it. Um, when I started interviewing people in what's called the PSYOPs community, psych psychological operations, prop propaganda, perception management, however you want to put it, you know, they knew that this was going on. They knew that this thing had been opened, but it was never something that was reported. And again, this is like a multi-million dollar agency. And, you know, I understand some things need to be a secret, but should they at least tell the public, like, we're creating a new agency that's, you know, a bunch of your tax dollars are going towards. They didn't even disclose it. All This was the only, my sources were telling me that it existed, but this is the only public record reference that I could find um, to it. And what, what, what do they do? Well, um, so not, so I, I sketched out for you the, the origins of perception management. More recently, during the Bush administration, um, after 9-11, but right before the invasion of Iraq in the, in the, in the run-up, in the interregnum, um, they established their own perception management office um, by uh, then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. And so um, what was interesting at that time was uh, when this was created, they started, um, you know, pumping out uh, propaganda and disinformation, which ended up finding, because it's in the age of the Internet, the there's a legal distinction between propaganda that's targeted at foreign governments who don't enjoy constitutional protections, foreign countries, and um, domestic American. But post the internet, that wall has kind of dissolved. And so what they found during the Bush administration was disinformation targeted potentially at domestic Iraqis or maybe Europeans who were who were wobbly in their support for the for the in the run up to the war. Um, that ended up finding its way back to the American press. It became a huge scandal and under massive public. Um, pressure, they had to shut down that office. Now, when we look at it today, uh, the opening of this office, there's no attendant concern or, or anger. People didn't seem to care much about it. Do you have a sense of when the new iteration opened up? Uh, because uh, you write, too, that in 2012, there was uh, an amendment to the law that inhibited um, propaganda to be 
uh, propagated in this country, I guess. And but um, like you say, during the Bush years, there was, oh, we just <laughs> we put it on a European website and uh, lo and behold, it it's obviously. Um, yeah. But but when, like when did that one end and this one start? Well, this one is brand new. It just began this last fiscal year. If you look through the DOD budget um, and, you know, based on sources I've talked to that work in that space, um, this is something that's not existed for more than several months now. Um, and what's interesting about it is if you look at the budget documents to give you some clues, again, this is, a, this is something that exists on the high side and the classified side. So it's limited what they'll say about it. But what they said is there it's, is that it's going to um, oversee and manage other DOD efforts the idea being that there are going to be sub offices underneath it. Their that's the coordinated um, uh, office. That's that's kind of like the conductor for all these different. So and so we don't know about the different subordinate efforts. Those have not been mentioned. But it seems like it's part of a broader push um, in this arena. And to speak to your um, point earlier, I think the domestic versus foreign distinction has always been a little bit shaky, just because. Um, so even prior to the internet, you know, if you read the New York Times, um, you'll you'll find articles that uh, were based on wire services like Reuters, which are based in the UK. And so there's always been, um, you know, this problem of, you know, if you're going to pump disinformation into some foreign country, how, are, how is it not going to find its way back? And so, so you know, I, I think they've always been on kind of shaky ground. But with that amendment to what was called the Smith-Munt Act, which um, prevents what's called uh, public diplomacy, that's a polite word for propaganda from from reaching um, Americans. So they amended that. But instead of strengthening it, they basically just threw their hands up and said, well, in the age of the Internet, what can you do? <laughs> so they well, just got rid of the protections. I mean, even embedded in the obfuscation or the hiding of this perception management uh, group, that in and of itself is a form of propaganda, right? Like just the fact that that by omission, they're omitting this from it getting to the public. That is proof that these kinds of efforts come home domestically. It's really extraordinary. Again, this is an office that I, I was able to find a procurement document saying um, n numbers, I think, in the tens of millions in terms of funding. So it's like this is not some small thing that it's like, oh, whoops, we forgot to put it down. Like this should be something, at least in general terms, that the public has an idea about what's going on. And then, as you say, you have to ask, well, why aren't they disclosing that? I imagine because they don't want a certain kind of response. Uh, I mean, and, and, you know, there's no you're not jeopardizing national security right. to say that the existence of this happened, you know, it, it exists. I, I would imagine we're not jeopardizing national security if we were to go down through every single thing it does. Have you, when you ask the Pentagon, uh, what's this organ? what's this office? What are they doing? Do, do you have any idea of like, uh, more, I say, I guess, granular uh, information than it's just general propaganda. Are they like, like what, what is the ilk of this stuff? Yeah. So I got lucky. I have a source that works in the psyops area who had access to a, a memo that, um, that uh, the Pentagon um, disseminated to a private institution that they were coordinating with to create this sort of disinformation. It gives you it gives you a pretty s specific idea of what it is that they're up to. So they did this exercise with, with some university where they're saying, okay, so we want to, you know, we want to perception manage in some foreign country, the attitudes towards, um, uh, let's say there's like a U.S. weapon sale and we want to sell them a weapon instead of, say, the Chinese or the Russians selling them a certain weapon system. How are we going to make it seem prefer preferable or positive to a domestic environment that maybe doesn't have the best views or at or most positive attitudes towards the United States. So since it's the Pentagon, this is going to relate to the military and national security. But the idea is um, changing public opinion in in foreign countries to a way that's amenable to whatever the Pentagon's interests are. So that's sort of like election interference. <laughs> Literally, yeah, and that, and ironically, that's where a lot of this stuff is coming out. If you look at how they try to portray it, they're like, "Well, we're actually fighting disinformation." Disinformation, in that case, being um, the public is is mi the, the foreign public that we want to sell weapons to is misinformed about the the benevolence of the U.S. government, kind of thing. So, so the distinction between disinformation and uh, counter disinformation ends up breaking down in a lot of cases because they were a lot. Post 2016, you know, there was a um, Russian sanctioned, government sanctioned effort to, um, you know, propagate disinformation about the election, about uh, the Clinton campaign, all of which is true. Don't dispute any of that. Um, but uh, 
part of the response to that has been to just brand whatever it is the national security community wants funding to do is to say, oh, you do want to support counter disinformation, right? Like you remember that, that whole Russiagate thing. Don't you want to try to stop that? And then you look at the actual details of what they're doing. And this doesn't seem like counter disinformation at all in any, in any honest sense, honest sense of the term. But again, since they're not forthcoming about what it is that they're doing, um, then there's no way to interrogate any of this stuff. Uh, you also write that there was another uh, office that it was opened. Are we talking about a separate one, the yes. Defense Military Deception Program Office? Yep, another part of the military. And what I like about the title of that, and again, another office that they were not very forthcoming on, on information about what exactly it does. I just like that they come out. The military is admirably frank in ways that the FBI and the State Department and other agencies are not. They just called it what it was. It's deception. We're deceiving people. And that's the, so the point, the point I'm trying to make in just naming that office, besides that it had never been reported before, and I, I, I want to cause some problems for them, was uh, just to show people it's like, no, here they are saying it quite openly that this is disinformation that, that they're doing. It does make it much easier. And, and do you have any more of a sense of what that uh, entity is supposed to be doing? No, I don't. My, my sources didn't have much insight into, into what it is that they do. Um, and, um, so what what happens next? I mean, this uh, theoretically, so we've got the IPMO, that's the, um, that is the first uh, sort of like, I guess, propaganda outfit. And then there's a second one. And this is also in the Pentagon budget, right? Right. So this is just the Pentagon. I've done a series of stories, a previous one. Um, was on the Foreign Malign Influence Center, which is in the office of the Director of National Intelligence, which is like they oversee the entirety of the intelligence community from the CIA to the FBI, so on and so forth. And so with, with these efforts, this is just what we have to know. Oh, can you frozen up on us oh, for right. a second? Yeah, if you can cut him down. Well, we'll, get, we'll, be, we'll be right back uh, with Ken. Well, uh, we seem to have lost, lost connection. Ken. With um, Ken. That is a hopefully weird... some sort of unnamed bureaucracy hasn't right. uh, cracked down. Uh, the bottom line is, folks, uh, we will put links to uh, both of Ken's stories on this. Um, we didn't have a uh, chance to discuss with him. The CIA does not know if Israel plans to bomb Iran. Um, yeah, but... check that article out there too. Just. It's it's instructive uh, to understand our relationship with Iran and how Israel fits into that. Yep. Um, and and just to, to recap uh, uh, Ken's piece, I mean, one of the things that in the run up to the 2016 election and following was and why it's really not terribly shocking that Russia would have attempted to interfere with uh the 2016 election or the 2020 for that matter is because we do that too mm -hmm. i mean um is, yeah that's a global uh, covert ops by foreign or by major world powers <laughs> yes and um one of the reasons why i was uh critical of russians interfering in our election is the exact same reason why I'm critical of the U.S. interfering with other people's elections. 
I am wholly against foreign entities uh, in any way, oh, uh, foreign entities in any way interfering with other people's uh, elections. Um, I don't know if we should go. Uh, I guess we'll just take a break and go to, to Nick. It doesn't look like uh, Ken is going to be yeah. back with us. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, we're going to be talking to Nick Terris, contributing writer also at The Intercept, uh, about his story. Another great piece of reporting. If you can imagine, um, unreported uh, 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 story of how many more people Henry Kissinger was responsible for killing uh, when he was a um, uh, defense or State Department or uh, national security advisor, really, uh, under, uh, uh, under Nixon. We'll be right back with that interview. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us, Nick Turris, contributing writer at The Intercept. Uh, Nick, welcome back to the program. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, so uh, on to uh, mark the occasion of uh henry kissinger's uh hundred year birthday um you've written a um well a couple of pieces in the intercept about this story but uh the the first one is blood on his hands um henry kissinger has been well known i mean i guess maybe less so you know as time has gone on uh but well known um uh, for uh his role in in vietnam in uh chile in east timor um uh, i think there's probably another half a dozen places uh, that uh, escape me at the moment um and and uh, was a well let's take it from there i mean it, give us the sort of um uh, the, the basics for folks who aren't aware of henry kissinger's uh, career what uh, who who was henry kissinger back in the late 60s uh, through the mid 70s. Sure, thanks again for having me on. Um, you know, Henry Kissinger was uh, Richard Nixon's national security advisor. And, you know, he wielded more power than any national security advisor before or since. Uh, when it came to um, war policy in Southeast Asia, that's the Vietnam War and the uh, adjoining wars in Laos and Cambodia, he was really something of a co-president in, in these matters, uh, an architect of this warfare. And he would go on to, at the end of the Nixon administration, be the uh, Secretary of State and stay on during the Ford administration. At that time, um, surveys show that he was the most admired man in America. Uh, he was also a, a great celebrity the most celebrated uh, diplomat of, of his age, maybe uh, ever in, in the United States. Um, so he, he wielded a lot of power in office and then upon leaving office, uh, founded uh, Kissinger and Associates, which uh, became really a broker between uh, nation states and corporations. Um, you know, he, he worked for uh, you know, titans, world leaders, kings uh, all over the world. So. You know, Henry Kissinger held great sway uh, in office and out of office, uh, you know, in, in the late 20th century. And it's even extended into the 21st now. And uh, we should say, I mean, as far uh, as far as we know, he has been advising all, all, probably all of the presidents since uh, Nixon's day, including uh, Trump. I would be surprised if Biden hasn't sought his counsel at one time or another. Um and I think he also has, you know, frankly, probably relationships with a lot of people in media uh, the, that influence like the, their perspective on, on foreign policy things. And um, and certainly, you know, uh, I, I, I there has been a lot written about Henry Kissinger uh, over the years in all of those sort of uh, theaters in which he engaged. And it's all I mean, there's a lot of dead bodies in the, the, his wake. Uh, but you have found um, you have done new reporting on this, um, which, uh, you know, as difficult as it may be to uh, 
make his legacy even more bloody. Uh, that's what that reporting has done. Uh, tell us, tell us uh, 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 how you came to uh, your involvement in this story, particularly in the bombing of Cambodia. Sure. I mean, I think the the key takeaway to my my recent reporting on Kissinger is that he's responsible for more civilian deaths in Cambodia than was previously known. And this is according to an exclusive archive of U.S. military documents that I assembled and interviews with uh, with Cambodian survivors, American witnesses. Um, The archive offers previously unpublished, uh, unreported and also underappreciated evidence of hundreds of civilian casualties that were kept secret uh, during the U.S. war in Cambodia, uh, during Kissinger's uh, tenure overseeing that war from 1969 to 1973. And, uh, and, and these are killings that remain you know, almost entirely unknown to the American people. And uh, you know, I, I coupled this with uh, previously unpublished interviews that I did with more than uh, 75 Cambodian uh, witnesses and survivors of U.S. military attacks uh, across uh, 13 villages along the Cambodian Vietnamese border. And speaking with these uh, people, you know, it revealed new details of the long-term trauma that's borne by survivors of the American war. So taken together, it adds to the list of killings and, and crimes that Henry Kissinger should, uh, even, even at this very late date in his life, be asked to answer for. So, so how unreported are we talking here? I mean, I know because I, I read the article, but for our audience, yeah. how unreported are we talking? Yeah, I mean, these were uh, records that I found, uh, what, what started it were records that I found in the National Archives. And uh, you know, basically, uh, there was a, a secret Pentagon task force that was set up in the wake of the My Lai massacre. Uh, this was a, a 1969 massacre by U.S. troops in South Vietnam, killed 500 Vietnamese civilians, uh, was covered up and was, uh, you know, eventually brought to light by uh, the great Seymour Hersh. Um, it was such a scandal for the U.S. military that the army uh, decided that they would never be caught flat footed by an atrocity scandal again. So they gathered up all the reports that they had uh, on war crimes and they uh, they, they put it them all together and had uh, a couple of high ranking officers in the Pentagon who watched over, you know, what was coming down the pike, what might be the next line, and they tried to tamp it down uh, whenever they could. Uh, in these documents, which I had used to, um, I did some reporting for the Los Angeles Times many years ago using the documents, and I wrote uh, a book uh, called Kill Anything That Moves the Real American War in Vietnam from these documents. but there was a small subset of Cambodian crimes in there. And I took those and I went back to the archives. I did more digging in, uh, in some other types of, of files, found more reports. I took all of these and they provided a, a rudimentary roadmap so that I could go to uh, Cambodia and fill out the reporting, uh, try to go to these same villages, talk to people there about what they saw. And in all 13 villages that I visited, I was the first American uh, to arrive, or at least the first uh, unarmed American, uh, first since the war. And, uh, you know, I was the first person that these people told their stories to. It was decades later, but uh, but no one had ever come to ask them about it. So really, these were uh, generally completely uh, unreported stories. Also, I usually went to find, you know, one particular case in the files, but what uh, Cambodian survivors told me about were relentless attacks. Uh, Generally, they didn't remember the single attack that I'd go there to ask about. And, you know, they they often found it laughable that I was asking about one attack because they said they were just attacked again and again and again by helicopter gunships, by uh, U.S. fighter bombers and... uh, yeah, so so they had much larger stories to tell than even those that I went to report on. Uh, just zooming out for a minute, will you give folks the background on on why it was like what was the theory? A, what was the theory about bombing Cambodia, um, and then B, the uh, relationship between Nixon and Kissinger and Kissinger's role in that bombing and the, the um, 
accel acceleration and expansion of the that bombing campaign. Um, it, 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 I, I mean, I I don't want to assume too much knowledge uh, 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 that people have of of uh, of Vietnam, but uh, the the idea was that there was staging going on. Really, on you know, uh, both by the the Viet Cong and and uh, I mean, primarily, I guess that was um, well. Uh, to tell the the quote that Kissinger had about it not actually bombing Cambodia. Yeah, uh, Kissinger is, has always uh, his his go to defense for this is that he, he wasn't bombing Cambodia or Cambodians; they were bombing North Vietnamese in Cambodia, and you know to. And, and, and there certainly were North Vietnamese and also uh, South Vietnamese guerrillas who used Cambodia, uh, you know, prior to uh, to Nixon and Kissinger taking office. It, it, it had been used for a long time. Also, there had been a lot of uh, cross-border operations uh, done under the, uh, the Johnson administration prior to Nixon coming to the office. Uh, this is generally left out. It was left out whenever Kissinger tells this story. He acts as if, uh, you know, both sides in the war weren't using the country uh, that, that just one was. But, you know, the, the genesis of the real expansion of the war into Cambodia uh, by, by Nixon and, and Kissinger, um, you know, it, it comes about because Nixon won the White House uh, and, and he, he came to, to office in 1969, uh, promising that he could provide uh, peace with honor uh, because he had a, a quote unquote secret plan to end the Vietnam War. Uh, the secret plan was was nothing more than expanding uh, the war, uh, expanding it further into Laos, expanding and accelerating it in Cambodia. Um, and to Nixon and Kissinger, it was very much a, a Cambodia would be a sideshow war. Uh, they were going to win the Vietnam War by dropping bombs in Cambodia. So about a month uh, into to office, uh, Kissinger sits down with his uh, military advisor, attache, uh, Alexander Haig, and they hatched a plan. They came up with an operation that was codenamed Menu. It was uh, kept secret from the American people, from Congress, and even from top Pentagon officials. Uh, the idea was to, to bomb these quote unquote enemy sanctuaries in Cambodia. And yeah, they created a conspiracy of cover stories, coded messages, and a dual bookkeeping system to uh, log airstrikes in Cambodia as occurring in South Vietnam. They did this because uh, they knew that uh, the Congress wouldn't approve an attack on a neutral country like Cambodia, and they feared a public backlash. So, you know, under this system, a colonel serving the Joint Chiefs of Staff named Ray Sitton would bring a list of targets to the White House for approval. And Kissinger would tell him, strike here, strike there, pointing on a map. It was very hands-on. Kissinger was picking where the bombs would be dropped in Cambodia. And then Colonel Sitton would back channel the coordinates into the field, circumventing the military chain of command. And then the authentic documents associated with those strikes were burned uh, phony target coordinates and forged data were provided to the Pentagon and then ultimately Congress. And this is the uh, this is the secret bombing, quote unquote. Um, ironically, it's it's the bombing we've known about probably the longest. Uh, they, but they kept it secret basically from 1969 to 1973, and then this came out in the swirl of Watergate crimes. And the secret bombing was actually. The, uh, the first uh, article of impeachment that was drawn up for Nixon, it was dropped for political expediency. They went after the domestic charges, but, uh, but you know, it, it was very much part of the, the Watergate conversation at the time and really the beginning of the Watergate crimes. I, I want to circle back to that because I think, you know, uh, there's a lot of legacies from uh, that, that, in, in that, that Kissinger, you know, and not particularly good ones, uh, legacies in terms of like what you can get away with, what you can, what the, what is acceptable, um, you know, actions by uh, the U S government and military because of Kissinger. But, um, l let's talk about the, the, the victims or, and, and w like the, the Delta between what we understood 
what we understood prior to your reporting uh, in terms of the killings and what we now know? Sure. Uh, like I said, the it's it's ironic that the secret bombing is, is the bombing we know most about. And that bombing, Operation Menu, uh, it consisted of uh, these B-52 strikes. So these huge uh, stratofortress bombers that flew a mile in the sky dropped 30 tons of bombs uh, on, a, on a small target area. So these are, are massive sort of impersonal bombings. Uh, and, and we should say, let me just say this too, like the advent of so-called smart bombs, which, which in fact are not as, not that smart, but the advent of smart bombs was a supposedly a response to these type of bombings. In other words, like, you know, when Kissinger says we weren't bombing Cambodia, we were bombing the enemy in Cambodia. That is, aside from it just being uh, ridiculous, just as a, you know, sort of broadly speaking, it's just an out and out lie. I mean, we were the amount of explosives that we are dropping there. Um, there, there is no technology that could pinpoint, but this certainly wasn't even remotely close to that. No, not at all. Uh, you know, Kissinger always uh, objects to this being called carpet bombing, but that that was the phrase at the time, and it, and it's an apt phrase because it was really uh, a, just a rolling, uh, you know, uh, sequence of, of bombs. They, they'd fall in what they used to call a stick. So it was just uh, as as this B fifty two slowly moved across the sky, just uh, a tremendous quantity of bombs, thirty tons uh, all at once in a in a target square. Uh, it would just obliterate everything below it. So even if you were, uh, and, and after being bombed so many times, Cambodians uh, dug bomb shelters next to their, their homes and uh, you know would, would go into them and, and sort of live in them, a subterranean existence for a lot of the time uh, to try and protect themselves. But if there was a B-52 strike nearby, the concussive force of it was enough to injure or kill, uh, even if you weren't hit by those bombs. I mean, this this was exactly, you know, how how powerful these bombs were. And when we're talking about just the raw tonnage, um, we'll never know, uh, partly because of the, the dual bookkeeping system and the burning of records, we'll never know exactly how many bombs were dropped in Cambodia, but somewhere above 500,000 tons. It's, it's tough to wrap one's head around that number. But uh, the amount of bomb tonnage dro dropped on Japan during World War II, including the atomic bombs, uh, was about 160,000 tons. So we're talking about, uh, you know, several levels uh, or, or, or uh, uh, levels of magnitude above that, 530, 540,000 tons. So a tremendous uh, a tonnage of munitions dropped. But the the attacks that, that I... Uh, uh, chronicle in, in my reporting are, you know, far more intimate than the the B fifty two bombing. They're uh, lower flying fighter bombers that uh, specifically attacked villages. Um, you know, there there was in Vietnam next door. Uh, villages were attacked on a on a regular basis uh, because they were in certain areas that the U S uh, claimed were free fire zones. They claimed they were allowed to just uh, target anyone in these areas because they had made an announcement or dropped leaflets and, and told people that they had to vacate. And if not, they'd be considered the enemy. And they took this method of warfare across the border into Cambodia. Sometimes they didn't even know they were attacking villages in Cambodia. They were using poor maps. They thought they were attacking Vietnamese villages um, you know, because these villages were right on the border. In any case, you know, they, they attacked these villages relentlessly with... Uh, these low-flying fighter bombers, and also with helicopter gunships. And, you know, I was able to trace in, in my reporting uh, orders that came down from the White House that you can find uh, the results uh, playing out in the field. There was uh, one case, I, I zero in on a phone call, it took place on December 9th, 1970. And Nixon called up uh, Kissinger in a rage about Cambodia. He was just uh, ranting, raving, said that uh, he was tired of the Air Force. Uh, these are his words, farting around there. Uh, he wanted the 
you know, the, the Air Force, or he wanted the U.S. military to go in and crack the hell out of them. Again, his language. Uh, he said, I want uh, anything that flies on anything that moves. Uh, so Kissinger says, yes, right. Yes, Mr. President. Hangs up the phone, calls up his uh, military advisor, Alexander Haig, and tells him, it's an order. It's to be done. Anything that flies on anything that moves. And you can see, uh, I, I found reporting at the time that showed uh, that by the, uh, you know, over the course of the month, the number of helicopter uh, sorties attacks in Cambodia tripled mm -hmm. and they continued to rise all during the spring of 1971. And this led to attacks on, uh, on Cambodian villages. And, you know, I, I tie it to one particular attack that I found in the files. Uh, it was one in which, uh, you know, this was in American records. It showed that American helicopters, what they called a hunter killer team of three helicopters, circled the village in Cambodia and then shot it up with, uh, with machine gun fire and rockets. Then uh, US and allied South Vietnamese forces landed and began uh, looting the village. Uh, an American officer there stole a Suzuki motorbike and he hauled it onto the helicopter. Uh, there were about two dozen wounded Cambodian civilians, including children, who were on the ground there. And a lot of the Americans on the scene, and, and I, I talked to them decades after the fact, but I, I tracked them down and interviewed them. They keyed in on one child. Uh, she was shot. She was bleeding. And some of the Americans wanted to take her for medical care. But the officer who dragged the motorbike aboard said negative, that they were weighed down by the bike. And because of the bike, they had no room. So this little girl, maybe five years old, shot, bleeding, in desperate need of medical care, was left to die. And this is, this is Henry Kissinger's legacy. It's the order that he gets from Nixon that he relays into the field that ultimately leads to this increase of, of attacks and uh, people to be uh, wounded and, and killed in Cambodia. And and the uh, the the in terms of uh, 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 you know going beyond that, and and we should say you know these um, uh, you you speak to people on the ground, and 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 like like you said, I think you, you just mentioned it was in 2010. So uh, many of these people are probably not even alive uh, today. Uh, it is is definitely worth folks going back and reading, but the the failure to impeach at that time, or to include that in the articles of impeachment ultimately, and the mechanism and the justification uh, uh, for these type of 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 raids on a country we're not at war with. <laughs> I mean, never mind, uh, uh, you know the question of whether we should be at war with a country, but this, these sort of like semi clandestine in this instance, clandestine, um, bombings of, uh, of, of these countries. Just talk a little bit about how that had set the sort of the template for what we see. We've seen in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Somalia, um, in, in Yemen to some extent, um, just, to me, that seems like, you know, at least part of the legacy and the, our failure to ever hold the people involved with this to account. And, and like you say, I don't know if people can appreciate this. I am old enough to remember when Henry Kissinger was like, I, I'm, I, I don't even know that there's a functional equivalent in in our society today. Well, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. He won the Nobel there's Peace that. Prize, but he was a celebrity. <laughs> yeah. He was like, I mean, you know, the images of him, I don't know if he actually went to Studio 54, but there was that quality of like the, uh, uh, of, of images of him at that time. And uh, there's been no real institutional or official reckoning with this yeah i mean it, it's a lot to unpack there um you know i i talked to uh, one of kissinger's biographers uh, about uh, the, the points that you raise about uh, you know the connection between uh the the war in cambodia 
and uh, the the Forever Wars today. This is and Grandin. Yes, this is Greg Grandin, the author of uh, Kissinger's Shadow. And Grandin told me that you know you can trace a line from the bombing of Cambodia to the present, and. Uh, you know, he he makes the point in that book and, and in conversations with me that the covert justifications for illegally bombing Cambodia, and this was, it was, it was illegal, uh, became the framework and the justifications for drone strikes and for the, the 21st uh, century forever wars. He calls it the perfect expression of American militarism's uh, unbroken circle. Those are, those are, <laughs> that's his language. Uh, and I think it's, you know, exceptionally apt. Um, I, another way, I mean, that that they're linked is that, um, you know, and, and I found this in my reporting, the interviews, the documents, they demonstrate a consistent disregard for Cambodian lives, you know, a failure to uh, detect the presence of civilians, to protect civilians, to conduct post-strike assessments, to investigate civilian harm allegations, to prevent this damage from reoccurring. And you know, uh, drawing on what you just said, you know, and or to punish or otherwise hold uh, U.S. personnel, and that's from those in the field all the way up to the White House, accountable for all these injuries and deaths. So these policies not only obscure the true toll of the conflict in Cambodia, but you know, they set the stage for the civilian carnage that we've seen in the war on terror, from Afghanistan to Iraq, Syria to Somalia. Um, you know, if I, I think that. You know, and 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 speaking with uh, military officials from that time, uh, have have also made this point to me that if there had been some accountability, if there had been transparency, um, they thought that there there, you know, uh, it, it would have had an impact on you know modern day uh, civilian harm, on on war crimes, on atrocities that have been committed uh, in in the the twenty first century forever wars. But because we didn't have this, you know, the Pentagon has been able to, again, get away with this again and again uh, by burying the evidence and acting as if it never happened. I, Nick? It, oh, oh. Uh, just one more question here. Uh, Nick, uh, it it also set the stage for deeper destabilization in Cambodia um, in the wake of these atrocities. I'm just wondering if you can expand on that before we let you go. Sure, uh, most definitely. And it's... it's uh, <laughs> You know, another area where when you examine the, the blood on Henry Kissinger's hands, I mean, uh, you know, he bears a, a, a great deal of responsibility for the rise of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Uh, the Khmer Rouge would, would come to power um, and uh, plunge the country into a uh, this campaign of, of overwork and torture, murder, mass murder. That eventually killed about 20 percent of the population about two million cambodians uh, but the khmer rouge when you know kissinger and nixon uh, came to the white house was a tiny fringe element uh somewhere between 1,000 and, and 5,000 people they held very little sway in in cambodia but uh, the khmer rouge ended up with a fantastic recruiting tool uh in the form of u.s bombing uh, the CIA, and I quote a CIA cable, secret cable at the time, and it, it only came to light decades later, where they say that the Khmer Rouge is going around to villages and recruiting, telling people, you know, the, the bombs that are killing, you know, your, your family, your, your neighbors, uh, there's only one way to stop that. It's to join our movement. Um, we'll become so powerful. We can fight the Americans. We can save our country. And in a you know a very short time between 1969 and 1973, this thousand-person uh, movement uh, is uh, becomes a 200,000-person uh, army that is able to take over the country and plunge the country into uh, you know a, a genocide. Without the destabilization of U.S. bombing, without uh, the recruiting tool that this bombing was, I don't think there's any way the Khmer Rouge would come to power. So while they bear ultimate responsibility for all these deaths, uh, Nixon and Kissinger play a vital role in this and are certainly not blameless. Uh, I think people can find analogies to this in terms of like our uh, our, our policies in Central America that uh, ultimately have destabilized, uh, not a one-to-one -one, uh, analogy, but the, the dynamic is the same. We can see this in just the development of like... Uh, 
the uh you know madrasas and and pakistan and uh, you know as an attempt to fight the the soviet union uh, in in afghanistan um uh, this is uh, this is a a really horrific example of that uh nick terse great reporting uh we will put a link uh to your piece uh to all those pieces in the intercept including uh blood on his hands um contributing writer at The Intercept. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much to both of you. I really appreciate having me on. Thanks, Nick. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigeland on The Majority Report. Uh, folks, just a reminder. Uh, we got a report of some scammers in our YouTube feed. Um in, our, in the comments section, we will never, ever, ever solicit money of you as an individual uh, in the in any type of comment section anywhere. Um, or even uh, over the phone if someone uses AI of Sam's voice. <laughs> exactly. I, I just we're not going to solicit money to get on. Keep the show. in mind my level of laziness. And if I, and also just general antisocial demeanor, mm -hmm. if I am, uh, you know, in any way, like saying like, Hey, it's great to, and also I got to say some of these people have like sort of stilted, uh, there's a little bit stilted, like, hello, hope your day has been wonderful. Like, that's not me. I'm not going to ever say that. I might even say like, I hope you've had a nice day, but I'm not, that's. Never are we going to solicit any money. So uh, if you're in there, just, and, and I would recommend, even if you think it is me, mess with me. You know, ask me stupid questions, this and that. And, um, you know, make accusations to it. Don't ever, ever, uh, you know, anybody who approaches to ever send them uh, money whatsoever. Uh, just a, a warning, because it's happened, I think, I know they're there and they're, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be on the lookout. And if you see anybody doing that, uh, you know, send us an email and let us know. In the meantime, I would like to solicit uh, money from you. <laughs> if you, uh, if you enjoy the show, you listen to it on a regular basis, uh, become a member, go to join the majority report.com and uh, become a member through the official means. I'm not going to interview you. I'm not going to ask you five thousand dollars so we can send you video equipment to uh, <laughs> interview. That's not what's going to happen. What is going to happen is you're going to allow this show uh, to survive and thrive, and you'll get the free half free of commercials, and you uh, will be able to I am the show uh, via our app. Everybody can use the app. It's free for everybody, regardless of what platform. It's a great app. It's very helpful. But uh, if you want to I am the show, you become a member and you get to I am us via that app um also don't forget justcoffee.coop fair trade coffee tea or chocolate use the coupon code majority get 10 percent off and check out cedar seeds mm. still time particularly if you have a long growing season where you live uh get that going i forgot to take pictures mm. uh cedarsseeds.com check those out Look who's back. I guess That's me. Uh, celebrate. Uh... Yeah. Well, look, Celtics had a valiant effort. We'll be speaking about that on uh, YouTube.com slash ESPN show being. today. I, I feel bad. Like, I wanted to talk shit, but then I saw his face. Um, so that I feel a little bit bad. Thank you. We'll be speaking about that. We'll give our finals predictions for both the NHL and the NBA. Uh, we'll talk about the owner machinations behind DeAndre Hopkins getting cut. Um, what it means broadly for just billionaire ownership of teams uh, and more youtube.com slash ESPN show. Iowa Ryan on the chat. I asked some guy in the comments how long it takes Sam go uh, numero dos. He had no idea. That's, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. That's a good question. Oh, and Saul will be back over incidentally uh, over the summer. Oh yeah. He's planning all the things he's going to say to embarrass me. It's, he's he's got the bug, as they as they say. Uh, 
Matt, what's happening on Left Reckoning? Uh, yeah, last night on Left Reckoning, we talked to Corey Pine about uh, privatization of space and how it's all billionaires doing this instead of NASA and what that means as a world. Uh, and also uh, Izzy Bear Breen talking about Minnesota legislative session, including the uh, successful, uh, uh, you know, um, things we all like to see from Minnesota and also uh, Governor Wall's veto and uh, also his role in uh, stepping in on the uh, to break the nurses strike uh, for Mayo Clinic. So uh, uh, it's show last night, patreon.com slash left reckoning. Uh, poof pastry. Alexander Haig was unfortunately the only Haig that Kissinger uh. ever answered questions from. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back. Uh, Sam Cedar, Emma Viglin, fun half of the Majority Report. Should we play that uh, video? I don't know. I think it's... we should hold off on maybe reporting yeah. on it. But yeah. uh, if it's what it purports to be, uh, I think all abusers should get that treatment on yeah. in front of their uh, colleagues. I, I, I don't know what happens at the end there, so I won't. Um... Uh, let's, I just wanted to touch on this, uh, suit. I, and I think what we'll do is have somebody on maybe, uh, on a Wednesday, actually, let's see if we can book somebody. Um, but we mentioned this at the top, we headlined this. And did you find out if that Philadelphia, um, hospital was, um, in 2016, I think it was 2016 at Netroots Nations was in Philadelphia. I believe it was 2016. Maybe it was 2018. 
In fact, I think 2019 it, Hanuman Hospital, which is yes. the city's poorest. Patients. Okay, yeah. So it was probably the 2018 uh, Netroots Nation, uh, and closed in 2019. So maybe 2018. okay. And there were protests about the closing of this Philadelphia hospital, Hanuman Hospital. And I think at the time, maybe we may have done an interview or two about uh, this um, this. Uh, uh, Pennsylvania Hospital uh, Network, uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, um, is a has a massive like hospital network in in Pennsylvania, and the SEI 